Before you start this video lesson, make sure that you've reviewed all the five different types of text structures, which are order and sequence, problem and solution, cause and effect, compare and contrast, and description. Then I want you to take a look at the text selection that we read on immigration and discuss with others what type of structure you think this text has overall. Now you can pay attention to individual paragraphs and make sure that you note which paragraph you're talking about. But you should be sure, whoops, you should be sure that you've had a chance to examine this overall. In considering the text structures, you might have seen the information about dates and assumed that this probably was a sequence or order type structure. Certainly, paragraphs 2, 3, 5, and 6 give us that kind of information because we do note our dates and also that we have order words like first, next, and third to help guide us. But if we consider what each paragraph is telling us overall, we know that paragraph one is giving us information about what immigration or what an immigrant is and giving us some reasons why. Leaving because they feared for their lives with dangers, left countries that were at war, left lands because they couldn't find enough work or food. So this gives us a little bit more of a description. Then, of course, paragraph two is about where they came from, talking about coming from Europe, England, other countries, and again, gives us more information about why, because we've got escaping persecution, um, convicts from jails, and then we even have some that came against their will that were captured. So again, that's more descriptive. Paragraph 3 then goes into information about the first wave. Paragraph 5 gives us information about the second wave. And then paragraph 6 is about the third wave. If you take a look at paragraph 4, paragraph 4 is more about attitudes or feelings of those already living in the United States. They weren't our immigrants weren't always welcomed, and it gives us reasons why. So again, a little bit more of a descriptive type structure. Now I had you complete a Google form answering many questions based on the text, and I hope that you were using the text to in fact go back and check answers. You had seven multiple choice questions. It was interesting because when I pulled up the results, I found that there was only one question that everybody agreed upon an answer for, and it was this first one. So I'd like us to take a look at each question and some strategies that we can use to help us make the best answer choice that we can. We know we have to take these crazy tests, but these tests are also helping us improve our skills of comprehension. And when working with informational text, often our answers are in the text for us to go back and figure out. You know I'm one to help give you strategies and tips to help you learn and grow. And when we have to approach a test situation, there are some tips and strategies that I find are really helpful. The first strategy or tip that I have for attacking a question is to look for keywords 
in a question. If you find these same words in the text, they will guide you as you select your answer. The next tip that I have is to proceed with caution. Now by that, what I mean is ensuring that you are really eliminating answer choices that just don't make sense or won't work. When you're given multiple choice questions, often there's some answers that are just ridiculous. And so you can say, you know what, I'm going to cross out ones that just don't seem to fit. That helps you narrow down a choice for a particularly tough or difficult question. The next tip I have is one that I just can't reinforce enough. Take time to go back into the text and check. You have it there available. There's really no excuse to miss a question when the answer is explicitly stated in the text. Now, sometimes you have to use the text to infer an answer, but again, that time to go back and check. And my final tip is when you're dealing with some kind of a written response question. This is why we spend time really thinking about what we're trying to say, claims that we're making, and citing evidence. That evidence is our proof. And so the reminder that I have or the tip is, you know, if you think about news reporters, news reporters have to be accurate in their reporting. They've got to fact check. And so my reminder is extra, extra, read all about it. When you're doing a written response or an extended question, cite evidence from the text or make sure that you are correctly paraphrasing. So again, here are my tips. First and foremost, look for keywords in the question. You can go back into the text and find these keywords to help you hunt for answers that you need. If it's a multiple choice question, you can eliminate answer choices that won't work. Cross them out. Eliminate them in your head. Always with any question. Go back into the text and check. The text gives you clues. There's no excuse to miss a question when you've got the information right there in the text for you. And then finally, for written response, extra, extra, be a reporter, fact check, and use that evidence. So let's practice with our first question. Now everybody got this one right. It says, how many waves of immigration does the text describe? Waves and immigration are key words. And when we hunt back in the text, we can find a first wave, we can find a next wave, and we can find a third wave. We can clearly count and identify that three is the correct answer. That's completely on the surface and easy for us. We didn't even really need to use the strategy of crossing out, but did you notice that we went back to the text and we checked? So let's examine this question. According to the text, there were strong anti-immigration sentiments in America by the late 1800s. Just already in this first sentence, we've got some keywords. We've got anti-immigration and late 1800s. And so if you come back into the text, while you may not be able to find the word anti-immigration as easily, you may have to hunt. But when it says late 1800s, then you already can pretty much eliminate some of the information that comes in paragraph two because this paragraph is talking about the 1600s through 1775. 
Now here you've got the first wave, 1820 to 1870, but it's not necessarily late, so you can move on. Here when you've got it started in 1881, that's probably a good clue that you're going to find some of the information you need because that fits late 1800s. Now going back to the question, we've got one cause of this was people already living in America, which we can go back to paragraph four. We've got those already in America. And then we've got that they feared newcomers would take jobs. So we can go back into the text and here we've got, look, some feared these newcomers would take away jobs. So what was one effect of this sentiment? This is where we've got to hunt and we've got to be a detective. So it says they feared newcomers would take away these jobs. So it's kind of getting into, I guess, a little bit of cause and effect. This is a cause, then what might be the effect of it? If you read on, you've got anti-immigration sentiments. Oops, let's just. Had become so strong that a growing number of people demanded laws to make it harder to become American citizens. Aha, here's a key sentence. So, one effect. Did immigration increase? The United States government passed laws, <clears throat> making it easier for immigrants to become citizens. The United States government passed laws intended to limit immigration. Or the economy became very bad because, I'm sorry, and the Great Depression started. Now, I went back and I checked, and so now I can cross out some answer choices that won't work. But it says people demanded it, that they make laws to make it harder. Then I can probably read on, too, to see that it was intended to limit immigration. So I can eliminate the fact that immigration had increased. If I look at the second answer choice, passed laws to make it easier, well, the text explicitly states here that these laws made it harder. So I can eliminate this answer choice. Now, when looking in the paragraph, I see that I've got economy and the Great Depression. I'm not sure. Let's see. If I read on... I can find these keywords of Great Depression down here. I don't really see economy, but read this sentence again. However, one of the greatest blows to immigration was the Great Depression. Now, was this an effect of anti-immigration sentiment? I don't see the connection there. So while I can't necessarily eliminate this answer choice, I can look again and I can say, but this is my best answer choice because when I read here, it says anti-immigration sentiments became so strong that a growing number of people demanded laws. And then it goes on to, in fact, describe some of these laws that were passed. Congress also passed. Other laws were passed. So the correct answer should be C. And it wasn't really too hard to figure out because we looked for keywords in the question, we went back to the text and checked, and then we also used some thinking to eliminate some answer choices that would not work. Now look at this next question. Sometimes there were cultural differences between the people already living in America and immigrants who had moved to America. All right, so some key words here. Well, we definitely have people already living in America. And if we remember, we've got those already in America. That's a big key word. Now the idea of culture. Need some schema for that. If you think about culture, Culture includes things like customs, religions, politics. So, if we look at our answer choices, 
We've got some immigrants left their native lands if they couldn't find work or food enough to live. Well, that's true. But does that have anything to do with the paragraph that talks about that they weren't welcome? This is a reason why immigrants left and came. But does this support the cultural differences between the people already living in America? Doesn't sound like it. So I think we can eliminate this answer choice. Now we've got some people in America didn't like the politics, customs, and or religions. Hmm. We already pointed out that as a, a key sentence. We have over 7 million people came to America during its greatest wave. Okay, that then, I guess, is a fact about the number of people. Does that have anything to do with those already living in America, though? Sounds like this is an answer choice we can probably eliminate because it doesn't have anything to do with the people already there. Finally, we have one of the greatest blows to immigration was the Great Depression. All right, that certainly impacted immigration. But again, does it connect to those already there? It doesn't. So if you look at your answer choices, this is really your best answer choice. And it's based on information that's explicitly stated in the text. So again, we use that strategy. We looked at keywords and we eliminated answer choices. And of course, what did we do? We went back to the text and we checked. So this next question, we talk about how can the United States attitude towards immigrants during the late 1800s best be described? So again, keywords, we've got the attitude towards immigrants and we've got late 1800s. So those are our keywords. Now, of course, if we go back into the text and we start checking, then we know that we're not looking at anything here, we're going for the late 1800s. So we're looking at what's going on here. We've got choices of accepting, unfriendly, ambivalent, and tolerant. We don't have these words being used explicitly in the text. So we're going to have to do some figuring out and using what we know. Now, there's a great word here, discriminated against. And if we come down here, discriminated means treated differently or unfairly. We've also got the idea of these anti-immigration sentiments. So we can start to gain a sense of the fact that people were not accepting. We can eliminate accepting. Because if they're being treated differently or unfairly, that certainly is not accepting. Unfriendly could still be a possible choice. We've got ambivalent, which you may or may not know the meaning of that word. And then we've got tolerant. Well, if you look at tolerant, tolerant means pretty much the same thing as accepting. I can tolerate things. So we can eliminate that as a list, as an answer choice. That gives us two possibilities. Now, if you're not sure about what ambivalent means, you do know what unfriendly means. And if you come back here to the definition of discriminated, treating unfairly, or if you think about people demanding laws to make it harder, unfriendly really seems to describe that attitude. And therefore, unfriendly is your best answer choice. Now, ambivalent actually doesn't mean accepting. Um, I challenge you to make that a word wizard word and look that one up. This next question refers to what the text is mostly about. We've really tried to work on the idea of what a main idea is. And I know we've talked about inferring a main idea using details. Inferring with details. 
And so before we look at these question choice or answer choices and try to eliminate any that won't work, we're going to go back into the text and we're going to check. But this time we're rereading parts to look for particularly patterns. I find when I'm looking for a main idea, sometimes I look for what's repeated. If I have repeated words, that repetition, like a pattern, helps me infer what something could be mostly about. And so, of course, we've already established that the word immigrants repeats many, many times in this text. But I want us to notice that we have the word wave being repeated. Got it repeated a couple times in this paragraph. And here it is over here a few more times. And then again, if you think about what each paragraph is mostly about, this one being about what immigrants are and why they came, this paragraph being about where immigrants came from, and again, why they came. Then we have this paragraph devoted to wave one. This one is more descriptive about attitudes. This paragraph deals with wave two. This paragraph deals with wave three. And then we have our conclusion. So. Going back up to our answer choices, we can eliminate some that won't work based on what we have here. We've got the waves of immigration. Well, wave is being repeated, so here's a possible answer choice. How views on immigration have changed. I don't know that I have any evidence in the text to support this. I think I can eliminate that. I've got the impact of immigration on economy and culture. Well, the word economy is, I think, listed maybe here, and I'm not sure that it really comes in anywhere else, except for maybe here, looking for an economic opportunity. So this answer choice can be eliminated. Then we have discrimination against immigrants. Well, we know that definitely was happening, particularly here in the paragraph describing the second wave, because that's where we have different laws that are passed. But is this something that we can say the text is mainly about? And so when I go back and I review, and then I reflect on patterns, in this case, the idea that three of these paragraphs is about waves, then I can determine this, this passage is mostly about waves of immigration. Now, look at this question. This question actually gives us what we need. Read the following sentences from the text. And so we really don't have to go back into the text and check because they're providing the piece of text that they want us to focus on. But if we reread it, we know we've got a word in bold print. In 1875, Congress passed its first immigration law intended to limit immigration. It kept people who were viewed as undesirable out, including convicts. In 1882, Congress also passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. It prohibited Chinese workers from coming to the United States. Here's our question. Based on the text, what does limit mostly mean, or most nearly mean? We've talked about meanings of words and multi-meaning words, and we've worked on the strategy of figuring out what a word means in context. Now, the really great thing about getting a multiple choice to choose from, as opposed to coming up with the idea on our own, is that we can use a substitution type strategy. I can take each of these words and I can try to replace it in the text to see if it makes sense in context. So I can start with the word restrict. In 1875, Congress passed its first immigration law intended to restrict immigration, restrict or limit. Okay, that answer looks like it could, in fact, make sense. So I'm going to hang on to it as a possible choice. Now, just to be sure, because I don't ever just rely on my first choice, I always check everything, 
I'm going to go with increase. In 1875, Congress passed its first immigration law intended to increase immigration. Hmm. If they're trying to keep undesirables out, I don't think they're trying to increase anything. So, yep, I can certainly eliminate that answer choice because, hey, guess what? It just does not work. So let's move on to Spike. All right. In 1875, Congress passed its first immigration law intended to spike immigration. I don't know about you, but when I think of spiking, I think of something going up. And so I'm not sure that answer is going to work. And now I can move on to the final answer choice of widen. In 1875, Congress passed its first immigration law intended to widen immigration. Well, again, widen Suggests making something get bigger. That's not what's going on. They're trying to keep undesirables out. So it was pretty easy to narrow down to restrict being my correct answer. And I did it by using the context clues. I substituted the answer choices for the word in the text. Or I replaced them and read them to see if they made sense. It's easy enough to do. It just takes time. Here's another type of question that does not necessarily mean we need to go back and check because we're getting the piece of text that we need. Choose the answer that best completes the sentence. So keywords here being best completes. We've got to read through these words, read them in the sentence, and see which one makes the most sense. So if I start with although, in the late 1800s, America passed laws intended to keep certain people from coming into the United States. Although Congress passed a law in 1882 preventing Chinese workers from coming to the United States. That doesn't feel right to me. So Let's go ahead and try another answer choice. Let's try as a result. In the late 1800s, America passed laws intended to keep certain people from coming into the United States. As a result, Congress passed a law in 1882 preventing Chinese workers from coming to the United States. As a result, that signifies cause and effect. They're trying to keep people from coming, so if they're passing a law to prevent Chinese workers, that certainly would help. But I don't know that the connection is there strongly with this choice. So let's move on and read the next answer choice to see if it might fit better or if we can eliminate it. So now we have, in the late 1800s, America passed laws intended to keep certain people from coming into the United States. For example, Congress passed a law in 1882 preventing Chinese workers from coming to the United States. Ah, now it sounds like we've got America's passing laws, and this is an example of one of those laws. So that seems to fit best. However, just to be sure... However, we're going to try this answer choice and read it before we make our final selection. So now we have, in the late 1800s, America passed laws intended to keep certain people from coming into the United States. However, Congress passed a law in 1882 preventing Chinese workers from coming to the United States. Okay, however is a word that signals something's different. It's a great transition word, but it's definitely not one that's going to fit here. 
however, would mean perhaps the opposite, and that's not the case. So, for example, makes the most sense because this is a law that's an example of one of those to keep certain people out, and the certain people being those Chinese workers. Okay, we're going to move on to an extended response that requires a written answer. And we still apply those skills of finding keywords. So we've got one reason and an immigrant moving to the United States. We don't need to use this extra, extra read all about it. We're definitely going to go back into the text and check. But now here, when we go back into the text and check, we're going to use text-based evidence. So this is where our extra, extra comes into place. I'm going to add something a little extra here for you to consider. When you are doing a test that is scored by somebody other than your teachers, you can pretty much assume that a robot's coming in and that a robot's going to score your answers. A robot is not used to reading your thinking. A robot is going to look for you to use correct conventions with capital letters and ending punctuation. Because here's the thing, we teach you conventions so that you write in a way that is easy for others to read and is accepted. Here's another key thing for you to keep in mind. Spelling words. There is no excuse for you to misspell a word that is clearly stated in the answer or even in the text. So when answering this question, the word immigrant should not be spelled incorrectly. You should not be spelling United States or even America incorrectly. You should be capitalizing these words correctly. If you're going back and citing evidence, you should be spelling correctly. Take the time to check these things because Mr. Robot here is not going to care who you are. And for something as easy as spelling a word wrong, they could tell you that your answer is incorrect. You could have great content and a beautifully thought out answer, but if you make careless mistakes, it's not gonna matter. So let's then go back into this text and check for some great keywords that we can use to cite. We know we need a reason that an immigrant would move. If you go back and read, the very first paragraph, again, told you some great reasons why. Fearing for their lives. Some countries were at war. They didn't have freedom to practice their religion. Or maybe they couldn't find enough work. Oh, wait. Check this out. Reason. There it is. One reason. So, you can very easily cite any of this evidence in your answer taking time to make sure that you spell correctly. When RoboGrader goes in, he's going to be looking for a list of reasons, and I guarantee his reasons to give you a check and all points possible are coming directly here from the text. So take the time, cite that evidence, take the time, spell that evidence correctly, and then take the time to reread your answer to make sure it makes sense and you've used punctuation correctly. Self-checking is just too easy. Now here's another written response question that of course we're going to find evidence to answer and to do that we're going to go back and check. Before we do, let's find some keywords in the question that we can use when we restate our answer and when we go back in the text. We've got laws. Describe two of the laws. I hope you read the number two correctly because you're not going to do just one, but two of them. So as we go back in the text, 
we go to the paragraph where it specifically talks about laws. Oh, here's a key word. People demanded laws. Oh, wait, what do we have? We have its first immigration law here. Okay, the first one intended. It kept people undesirable out. Then we have the Exclusion Act. Then we've got other laws were passed, and we've got another one described. Now, this is not a law, one of the greatest blows. It is not a law. So, we have the law that keeps out people who are undesirable, including convicts. Convicts. We have the Chinese Exclusion Act, preventing Chinese workers from coming. We have other laws like immigrants to have literacy skills. And then we have one that limits the number coming from countries outside the Western Hemisphere. So this is one possible example. Here's the second possible example. Three, you have four to choose from. You only need two. Again, Choose carefully, spell correctly, and then make sure that you address why. If you only describe those laws, but then don't explain why, RoboGrader will not give you full points. Two laws and why they were passed. So I can go back into the text and I can say, okay, We've got the one that was keeping undesirable people out, and I could explain why as um, perhaps because there were these anti-immigration sentiments because they wanted the undesirables out. I could talk about the Chinese Exclusion Act and say that's because they wanted to prohibit Chinese workers from coming. In fact... I could even pull a reason from back here. Why don't they want Chinese to come? Because they felt that people were coming to work in the mines and get rich. Which also brings me back to fearing that newcomers would take away jobs. There's another reason. Because it connects to these anti-immigration sentiments. If I'm talking about Law 3 with the literacy skills... I could infer why they would want them to be literate. So I can pick my two laws and make sure that I pick two laws that I can explain why. In this final written response question, again, we know we're going to find evidence and we know we're going to go back into the text and check. So if we take a look at some key words, We've got factors that influence people's opinions, and we've got the late 1800s. By now, I think we've read this text so much that we know that we've got this paragraph here that really talks about how people felt. We also have this paragraph that gets into anti-immigration sentiments. So, a factor that influenced the opinion. All right, well... What were they afraid of? They feared that the immigrants would take their jobs or they didn't like politics, customs, and religions. Here are some great examples. Uh, we've got this one, how Irish people were excuse me, discriminated against because they were Roman Catholic. So I think you have plenty to choose from. It's just a matter of making sure that you Use evidence from the text, because it even says to do it, and that you take time to spell check, reread to make sure it makes sense, check your capitalization and punctuation. You know, most of this is about just taking the time to do your best job possible. And so, while we're working on being great readers and understanding what we read, we're thinking about all of the strategies that we use. But let's face it, it does come down to being able to employ all of our great skills when we take a test. 
Remember to look for keywords. If it's multiple choice, eliminate answers that won't work. Always, always take the time to go back and check. I can't say that enough. When doing written response, extra, extra cite that evidence. When you're considering a tire text and you're doing multiple readings, because that's what we'll take, in particular, looking for patterns or repeated parts to help you infer overall main ideas. And then finally, keep in mind that it's not your teacher reading your work. It's probably going to be some robot and spelling matters.